good evening everybody on behalf of the ceylon college of physicians you all are welcome to the second session of the peer learning periphery to the for 2023 online case discussion by physicians away from the center my name is dr rohit amara vitarna the moderator of the today event we know that the physicians working in outstations with limited resources have evolved excellent clinical skills in patient management so there is a lot to be learned from them peer learning periphery to the fore is a platform for the physician who work away from the center to share their knowledge and experience with us in this session two physicians present and discuss clinical cases in one hour period today we have two consultants from district hospital ampar and ashrof memorial hospital kalmuni at the end of the both presentations we will discuss questions received from the audience uh, please send your questions to qna box let me to introduce the first speaker today dr uh, gp atukoral acting respiratory physician district general hospital ampar dr gayanath atukoral mbbs peradeniya md kalambu currently working as acting respiratory physician district general hospital ampar his special interest is interstitial pulmonary uh, pulm pul interventional pulmonology and chest infection he is going to talk on a patient presented with pulmonary mucomycosis over to you dr atukar thank you very much sir uh, thank you very much for kind words of introduction Uh, uh good evening everybody uh, first of all i would like to thanks the ceylon, Co ceylon college of physicians uh, and organizing committee to giving me this opportunity to share the uh, clinical skills and the clinical knowledge we, which we have gained uh, when we are working in the peripheries today i am going to uh, discuss two cases of pulmonary mycosis i select that topic because uh, even though it is uh, very rare fungal infections we have diagnosed uh, three cases of pulmonary mycosis last year uh, in general hospital ampa uh, let me uh, start with my first case my patient is 62 year old lady she is from ampara she is a housewife uh, she is a non patient with type 2 diabetes hypertension and dyslipidemia on regular treatment for last 6 years uh, glycemic control was not satisfactory and poor compliance with uh, poor knowledge and uh, this is has been not investigated uh, for the complication and uh, the, currently it was complicated with stocking type peripheral neuropathy up to the ankle and background retinopathy she presented to us with cough and left sided pleuritic type chest pain for 3 months which is associated with constitutional symptoms which was noted last two months to the patient she presented to us as she has developed low grade tb in pyrexia for two weeks duration she had a productive cough which produced scanty amount of non tolerant sputum but no hemoptysis no history of chronic lung disease no contact history or past history of tuberculosis not on any immunosuppressive treatment neither on long term steroid treatment on examination she is safe right no finger clubbing no cervical low axillary lymphadenopathy no peripheral stigmata of lung cancers or infective endocarditis on auscultation uh, left lower lobe post peptisions was noted her maintain her saturations on rumia 98% abdomen soft no ergonomically hard dual rhythm no murmurs this this is the basic investigations total white cell count uh, 8.8 uh, with neutrophil 67% hp 13.6 grams per deciliter with normal uh, red cell indices platelet count normal the inflammatory markers not too high esr was 66 and crp marginally high that was 7.8 mg per deciliter sugar control actually very very poor fasting sugar 314 and uh, Glycated hemoglobin level thirteen percent, but ketones were negative. 
this is the chest x-ray uh, you will appreciate there's a, a round lesion cavitatory lesions in the mid zones of the left uh, lung actually with the uh, given history and uh, baseline investigations we were first uh, thought about that could be a malignancy uh, after that as the esr was 66 this could be a infections most probably tuberculosis because we are in moderately burdened country and uh, other than that uh, this could be a even bacterial infections or fungal infections or could be a uh, vasculitic lesions as well so we proceeded with uh, further investigations but tuberculous uh, investigations was completely normal including man to test and uh, sputum gene expert test also uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis not detected and uh, we proceeded with the CECT test uh, it shows there is a irregular air filled cavity in the superior segment of left lower lobe measuring 2 into 1.6 into 1.7 centimeters. It is located within the patch of consolidations closely related to the descending thoracic aorta. No fluid level or intracavitatory bodies. Rest of the lung parenchyma appears normal. No hyla or media spinal lymphadenopathy. That uh, concluded that the uh, patch of consolidation and uh, central cavity in the uh, superior segment of left lower lobe. Then uh, we went ahead with the bronchoscopy as the TB screening was negative and you will appreciate that uh, there is a uh, infame left lower lobe mucosa uh, with uh, occlusion of the uh, bronchial orifice with thick parulent uh, Secretions. It will be clear. Right. We have taken the sample for bronchial biopsy for histology, bronchial brushing for cytology, and uh, bile, that is bronchial lavage for fungal cultures and bacterial cultures. Bronchial biopsy. There are ciliated column epithelial cells and seeds of neutrophils and many eosinophils. A few fungal hyphae are also noted. These fungal hyphae are wide hyphae with the infrequent branching and uh, no septation. Uh, that conclusions, this is suggestive of uh, mucomycosis. Uh, this is the light microscopic view. Your uh, left hand side, it is low power. Uh, I'm not sure, so sure whether you can identify this uh, fungal high fee. Uh, your right hand side, it is high power fee. And we made the diagnosis of pulmonary mucomycosis secondary to uncontrolled diabetes mellitus. The optimal management would be optimization of this underlying comorbid illness and surgical intervention followed by medical management. Uh, we proceeded with this baseline liver and renal functions and ultrasound abdomen just to exclude whether there's any other focus of fungal infections. And we have done the assessment, uh, just assess the fitness for the general anesthesia. Then we have referred to thoracic surgical opinion as the lesion is close to the aorta, best management would be medical treatment. Further opinion taken from consultant microbiologist, uh, mycologist, and uh, suggested to treat with the intravenous liposomal amphotericin B, uh, which is uh, three milligrams per kg per day. Uh, because uh, we can't offer for the surgical intervention for this patient, uh, I was thinking that uh, we are removing the foreign bodies from the bronchoscopy and especially in ICU patients. Uh, we are cleaning this bronchial tree uh, with, when there is a lot of uh, mucus plugs are there. Therefore, I was thought that uh, why I can't do uh, this uh, uh, removal of this debris through the bronchoscopy. Therefore, I did the bronchoscopy uh, repeatedly and I remove this stuff which has stagnated in the bronchial tree. Uh, actually, I did the uh, first bronchoscopy at the time of diagnosis, my second bronchoscopy at the uh, day 10 of antifungal treatment and day 20 and at the end of treatment, uh, that is after four weeks time. These are the results. Uh, this is the chest x-ray after 10 days of antifungal treatment. 
uh, still this cavitation is persisting. And uh, actually we have treated with uh, IV ampitericin for 28 days. Uh, at the end of 20 days, that uh, bronchial blushing says that uh, they have not seen the fungal hygiene. Uh, normal bronchial epithelial cells with inflammatory cells, they have detected. Uh, this is the treatment after three weeks of antifungal treatment, uh, the chest X-ray uh, view. Actually, this patient fully recovered from the fungal infections and uh, we have detected that recovery biochemical parameters radiologically and uh, bronchoscopic evaluations and psycholo psychological assessment. Uh, the final bronchoscopy, actually, that the bronchial tree was perfectly normal. It was fully patent. <clears throat> this is the last uh, bronchoscopic brushing report. Uh, uh, many scattered reactive bronchial epithelial, only no fungal hyphae seen. Actually, we have sent three samples of uh, bar for fungal culture. None of these uh, cultures reveals any fungal growth because uh, these uh, mucomycosis are very, very fragile organisms. Uh, this is one of the challenge we have. These are the challenges with regards to my first patients. Uh, because the surgical management was not possible due to major structures adjacent to the uh, fungal lesions. And uh, we have overcome this by doing the repeated bronchoscopy and uh, washing out of this uh, debris and uh, removal of this debris uh, with the biopsy. At the time of diagnosis, uh, even conventional ampotericine or liposomal amp ampotericine not available, none of the hospital in Sri Lanka. But luckily, we have get down some uh, liposomal uh, amphotericine, 30 vials from PH Anuradhapura. And uh, liposomal amphotericine is very, very expensive. Actually, uh, when we are giving 3 milligrams per kg, we have to give 3 vials per day. That each vial will cost about 60,000. Uh, actually, this patient can't afford for that as well. After 14 days of treatment, uh, her renal functions was altered. Therefore, we have to uh, reduce the dose of empotericine. And luckily, with the good hydrations, uh, the, the renal functions back to normal. Therefore, we have continued the same proper dose of empotericine. Because uh, with empotericine, patients develop loss of appetite and sometimes vomiting as well. And none of these fungal cultures become positive for the fungal growth, that is uh, uh, due to uh, it takes long time to transfer these samples to the MRI within 24 hours, it is not possible to send the sample all the way from Ampara. That is my first case. Uh, my second case, uh, she's 52 year old lady, housewife, she's also from Ampara. She also diagnosed as having type 2 diabetes, hypertension and bronchial asthma. Her glycemic control was satisfactory and having uh, no uh, asthma exacerbations in the recent past and not on any long-term steroids. She presented to us with persisting cough with intermittent mild fever over one month duration. She had productive cough, uh, produced a scanty amount of pablon sputum, but no hemoptysis, noted significant weight loss and loss of appetite. Uh, which, which is associated with right-sided pleuritic type chest pain and no past history of tuberculosis or contact history of tuberculosis. She has lost about 4 kilos over one month and no lymphadenopathy, no finger clubbing. Her saturation was 95 on room. Yeah. Uh, on auscultation, uh, right upper zone, bronchial breathing with uh, post uh, repetitions noted. Hemodynamically patient stable, abdomen soft, and no ergonomical. This is her investigations. ESR was very high, 135. Full blood count, 12,000, with HB 10.7, and platelet count, 412,000. Liver and renal functions within normal limits, and fasting sugar, 105, and glycated hemoglobin, 7%. This is the X-ray finding. Uh, you will see that uh, there's a ca big cavity relations with uh, very high inflammations with pleural thickening. With the given history and baseline investigations of high ESR, uh, our first-hand 
first diagnosis was pulmonary tuberculosis. These are the tuberculosis uh, screening uh, results. One, two test was 13 in spite of this uh, diabetes mellitus. Three samples of sputum was negative. And uh, sputum for gene expert, uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis was detected, but uh, rifampicin resistance was not detected. Therefore, our diagnosis was bacteriologically confirmed pulmonary tuberculosis, and we have uh, taken the uh, sputum sample for TB cultures and started uh, anti-TB treatment as a new case. After about three weeks, patient again presented to us that uh, she says that symptoms was not improved and she has uh, further uh, complaining of further weight reduction about three kilos over three weeks and deterioration of general conditions. Worsening of this pleuritic type chest pain associated with scanty amount of hemoptysis and develop high grade intermittent fever. On examination, patient is febrile and her saturation was 87 on Romia. Uh, auscultations, uh, again, we uh, detected that reduced AINT and bronchial breathing, but patient hemodynamically stable. These are the possibilities that uh, tuberculosis not responding to first time anti TB treatment. And poor compliance, whatever the patient says, we can't predict that. And uh, acquired another infections, maybe pulmonary infections or other organ involvement or exacerbations of other underlying disease, something like connective tissue disorders or maybe con conversions to the malignant changes. This is the X-ray. You will appreciate that further deterioration of this uh, X-ray shadow with uh, significant right-sided volume loss. These are the basic investigations. CSR now, in spite of NTTB treatment, it has gone up to 142, CRP 347, and uh, none of the cultures become positive for bacterial uh, culture, sputum, uh, blood, and urine. Uh, but uh, TB screening now, conversion, in spite of this one month, actually at the end of one month only, we have done this TB screening. Uh, even the expert now, mycobacterium tuberculosis not detected. White cells has gone up to 18,000 with neutrophil leukocytosis. After that, uh, we proceeded with this uh, CT cap and uh, they have detected thin wall large cavity at the right lung apex, measuring about uh, 5.4 into 2.2 into 3.3 centimeters with uh, bronchiectatic uh, changes involving the right uh, apical and an anterior. Uh, segment bronchi, but no definitive evidence of uh, malignancy and rest of the lung fields are clear, no uh, intrathoracic lymphadenopathy. As we have already completed one month of anti-TB treatment uh, uh, without any hesitation, I have proceeded with bronchoscopy and I have noticed that uh, right upper lobe uh, bronchus was occluded with very thick parulent secretions. Uh, which is uh, dark in color with the highly inflamed mucosa, the rest of the bronchial tree was perfectly normal. Uh, then I have taken the sample, bronchial brushing, uh, bronchial biopsy, and washing for the uh, fungal culture. Uh, because uh, as I have the experience, uh, by looking at the uh, bronchus, I noticed that this also could be a case of uh, pulmonary mucomycosis. Uh, it uh, biopsy also concluded uh, that uh, morphology of uh, fungi favor mycomycosis. This is the brushing. Again, it's confirmed that it's looked like uh, morphologically, it's looked like mycomycosis. And uh, we have uh, optimized this comorbid illness and we have to manage this patient in high dependence unit because the saturation also uh, low side. And actually, this patient refused that surgical intervention. Uh, therefore, we have to do the same uh, bronchoscopic intervention as we have done for our previous patient. And we manage medically with IV, liposomal, and proteracin B. And uh, we have done repeated bronchoscopy and remove the debris, uh, which is there in the right upper lobe. And we have continued this usual NTB treatment. Uh, we have completed uh, six months.
This is the chest X-ray after three weeks of antifungal treatment. Actually, at that time, we have completed intensive phase of anti-TB treatment. And uh, this is the bronchial brushing report after 20 days. Uh, actually, we have not seen any fungi, uh, but only the reactive bronchial epithelial cells and some neutrophil uh, inflammatory cells only. Outcome, actually this patient also recovered from both infection. This is the chest X-ray after six months of anti-TB treatment. These are the challenges we have come across with this patient. Uh, this is not a simple case. This is simultaneous infections of tuberculosis and mucomycosis. And uh, biggest problem is patient refuse uh, surgical intervention. Therefore, we have managed this patient medically. And uh, very close supervision of liver functions and renal functions needed because both of this regime can cause liver and renal derangement. Uh, with that, I will proceed with brief uh, discussion of uh, mucomycosis, mainly focusing on pulmonary mucomycosis. Mucomycosis is relatively uncommon invasive fungal infections. Uh, it is previously known as psychomycosis and uh, after a few decades it has uh, changed the name. They have changed the name as mucomycosis. Uh, the incidence rate of mucomycosis globally is very very low. That is about 0 0.005 to 1.7 per million population. But in India, that uh, incidence rate is very, very high, uh, more than 50 times uh, the usual uh, incidence rate. Uh, the true incidence and the prevalence of mucomycosis may be higher than that, uh, that uh, it has appears. It is the third most common serious fungal infection, secondary to aspidosis and candidiasis. The genera most commonly found in human infections are rhizocus, mucor, and rhizomucor. And uh, depending on the ge geographical locations, that species could be varied. Uh, we have five types of, uh, five main types of mucomycosis depending on the organ involvement. Uh, most common thing is rhinoorbital cerebellar mucomycosis, most common in poorly controlled diabetes and especially after kidney transplantation. And pulmonary mucomycosis, common after organ or stem cell transplantation and uh, patient with cancers. And gastrointestinal mucomycosis, more common in young, premature uh, children. And cutaneous uh, mucomycosis, common em among IV drug abusers and uh, HIV patients. And disseminated mucomycosis, when there's bloodstream dissemination occurs, uh, it is very, very bad prognostic uh, category. These are the risk factors. Almost all patients with invasive mucomycosis will have some underlying disease, diabetes mellitus, and particularly with ketoacidosis because this fungal, fungi may have ketolase. Therefore, uh, they will grow very rapidly in acidic media. And treatment with glucocorticoids and hematological malignancies and hemopoietic stem cell transplantation and solid organ transplantation and treatment with desferioxamine as well as iron overload and tuberculosis. Other than that, HIV infections, uh, IV drug abusers and trauma and burns and malnourished people. And uh, recent COVID-19 infections because uh, uh, COVID pneumonitis, we are managed, with, uh, managed aggressively with high dose of uh, steroids, which is immunosuppressant as well as it will cause altered sugar levels in diabetic patients as well as non-diabetic patients. Both of these factors might be contributing for uh, infections. Diabetes is the main underlying disease in low and middle income countries and mucomycosis is considered as diabetes defined disease as well. And blood cancers and organ transplantation would be the commonest underlying problem in developed countries. Uh, briefly, uh, if you go through this pathogenesis, uh, these fungi found commonly in the environment. Uh, most people are frequently exposed to the fungal spores without developing the disease. Uh, 
uh, it is not transmitted between the people and it has been reported among some domestic animal as well but no evidence to suggest that the uh, infections goes from the animal to uh, human and the mycomycosis is generally spread by inhalations ingestion or inoculations through the damaged skin in pulmonary mycomycosis uh, pulmonary mycomycosis are acquired by the inhalation of spores in healthy individual cilia transport these spores to the pharynx and it will cleared off by the gastrointestinal tract in normal individual inhaled spores might uh, uh, inhibit from germination into the hyphae by alveolar macrophages but fail in that this spores will germinate and hyphae will develop uh, it will invade the blood vessels and cause thrombosis which to the tissue necrosis uh, this is the commonest clinical presentation they might present to us with fever of chest pain and uh, hemoptysis which could be a massive hemoptysis and shortness of breath uh, and pleuritic type chest pain as well diagnosis uh, biopsy and fungal staining remains the mainstay of laboratory diagnosis and uh, fungal culture will be supportive and we can detect the susceptibility as well. Uh, we don't have any antigen test uh, for uh, aspergillosis. We can do the serum galactominin, but uh, in uh, mucomycosis, we don't have any antigen test so far. Uh, as the uh, fungi does not have a septa, it is very fragile and culture remains sterile and uh, treatment initiations are not necessary to wait until the fungal culture re reports and radiological imaging might be supportive of the diagnosis uh, these are the commonest radiological findings uh, commonest abnormalities would be focal consolidation masses pleural effusions or multiple nodules the presence of pleural effusions or more than 10 nodules may predict the mucomycosis a halo sign is highly suggestive of angioinvasive fungi. Reverse halo sign uh, may be more common among mucomycosis infections uh, compared to other angioinvasive uh, fungal infection. Uh, this is how we differentiate uh, mucomycosis from aspergillosis. Mucomycosis, you will see ribbon like broad uh, fungal hyphae uh, without any septa, branching with 90 degrees. Uh, in spite of this, the, that aspergillus uh, will be thin, uh, narrowed, and they are uh, septated and branching acute angle. When we consider the treatment, a combination of surgical debridement and antifungal therapy and elimination of predisposing factor is, the, is necessary. Uh, surgical debridement, aggressive surgical debridement uh, should be uh, applied as early as possible and we have to give the antifungal treatment as early as possible. Uh, initiation of this antifungal treatment uh, early will have the good outcome. And need to continue this amphotericine B until patient recovered fully from the fungal infections uh, actually, we may have to do the repeat biopsy to uh, demonstrate that the patient has been completely recovered from the fungal infections. Uh, we have to give several weeks of antifungal treatment. Uh, this is the prognosis. Uh, it tends to be progressive rapidly, fatal in about half of the sinus cases and two-thirds of pulmonary cases. Uh, almost all cases of widespread type and skin involvement uh, death rate about 15 percent and possible complications of mycomycosis include the uh, partial loss of neurological functions blindness and uh, clotting of blood vessels in the brain and lung uh, before winding up uh, i would like to mention few words about this amphotericin b uh, we have conventional amphotericin and uh, liposomal amphotericin this liposomal amphotericin would be less, less uh, nephrotoxic and patient will be having less side defects. They are very well tolerated. But uh, conventional amphotericin, uh, they will have a lot of uh, 
uh, nephrotoxic effects because they can cause the uh, distal renal tubular acidosis and uh, nephrogenic uh, diabetic insipitus. Uh, therefore, uh, but the thing is, if patient is having a uh, renal involvement, uh, that the best uh, treatment will be would be conventional amphotericin D because it has good uh, renal penetration. And uh, this is my take home message. Mucomycosis is relatively rare and rapidly progressive and fatal fungal infections, uncontrolled diabetes and immunocompromised individuals poorly responding to antibacterial treatment may have mucomycosis. If radiologically uh, revealed that patient is having necrotizing pneumonia, could be a case of mucomycosis. Early detection and initiation of treatment early will have the better outcome. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Dr. Atukol, for a very interesting and very informative presentation. Uh, we'll, we will discuss questions at the end of the both presentation. And please send your questions to Q&A box. The next speaker is Dr. A.M. Hafil, consultant general physician, Ashrop Memorial Hospital, Kalmuni. No, no, no. Dr. Atamba, Atamba Mohamed Hafi, MBBS Kalambu, Kalambu, MD Kalambu, overseas training at Sultana Bahia Hospital, Malaysia. He served in many hospitals in Sri Lanka as a consultant general physician, including BH Kalavan Chikudi, BH Akre Patu, and Kalmune North Hospital. Uh, he is going to present on dilemma in dengue, a patient presented with dengue fever. Over to you, Dr. Hafir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. I should say thank Dr. Rohit and the CCT for giving this opportunity to present a few cases on dengue. Today, I'm going to present three cases of dengue with uh, atypical presentation. The test case is a 17-year-old boy. Admitted a history of fit. He was apparently well. And sudden onset of generalized tonic-clonic type of seizure lasted one to two minutes. He didn't give a history of fever, headache, or had trauma. And there was no history of uh, epilepsy in the past. And he didn't give a history of substance abuse. On examination, he was drowsy, irritable. GCS was 13 over 15, a febrile, and there was no neck stiffness. And there was no neurological deficits. He moved all four limbs. Examination of cardiovascular and respiratory abdomen were unremarkable. Basic investigation showed normal vital count, fatal count 160,000, CRP was normal 7, his liver functions were normal, creatine was normal, sodium, potassium, calcium, and magnesium all normal. So we did a non contrast CT brain, it was reported as normal. The next day, the following day, he developed fever. Initially, there was no fever, the second day only, he developed fever, and he was still drowsy. So we thought he, he has got a cerebral infection and decided to do a lump of puncture and blood culture was taken. The CSF showed lymphocyte 12, neutrophil 0, protein slightly elevated, sugar was normal. Viral studies were sent to MRI. And the diagnosis made as viral encephalitis and IC, uh, IV acyclovir and IV septraxone started. The following day, the third day of admission, he was still febrile and the GCS slightly improved, 14 or 15, the blood pressure is normal, heart rate fast due to fever, his hematocrit is, was 38, and it shows the white circumstance of lymphocytosis, suggests your viral infection with low platelet, 100, uh, 10,000. Since he has a low platelet count, we suspect a dengue. So we did antigen test, it was positive. So we treated as dengue infection associated with dengue encephalitis. 
then we did the EEG, EEG showed a generalized slow wave activity suggestive of viral encephalitis. So, our final diagnosis was dengue associated with dengue encephalitis. So, dengue was treated as, as usual uh, fluid therapy as guided by the our national guideline. So, he gradually improved. And on, on day seven, he was afebrile, this is normal, blood pressure, blood, uh, blood count, all were normal. Data count picked up to 156,000. Dengue antigen antibodies, IgM and uh, Ig were positive. The cultures were negative. He was given antibiotic for seven days. Antiviral also given for seven days. On day 11, he was discharged. So we made a, uh, made a diagnosis of dengue associated with dengue encephalitis. The second case, a 22-year-old female admitted with, with four days history of fever, headache, and abdominal pain. On examination, she was conscious, rational, but febrile. She was not just sleep. Blood pressure 110 over 85, heart rate 102. There was a reduced ANT on the right lung base. The spirit was normal, 98% on air. Basic investigation for a viral con lymphocytosis with low blood count, 33,200. Uh, 3, Platelet count was low, 43,000, and the hematocrit was 48, slightly raised. And liver enzyme also raised. INR was normal. And since he had febrile illness with low platelet count, and there was effusion on the right side of the lung, so we diagnosed as clinical diagnosis. Dengue hemorrhage fever, and we treated with appropriate fluid management as guided by the guideline. So she improved slow, uh, gradually. On day five, she became afebrile. Her blood pressure is stable, is normal. Heart rate improved, urinalpetrolin improved. Blood blood count was 3,600. Plated dropped to 12,000. Came up with 42, but other parameters were stable. On day seven, he was, he was afebrile, blood pressure was no, normal, urine output improved, 90 ml per hour, white cell phone improved, and platelet also picked up to 98,000. In hematocrit 38, dengue, IgM, and Ig were positive. So she was stable and fit to discharge. So we planned to discharge. So while awaiting discharge, suddenly she developed a generalized conversion. It lasted more than 10 minutes. It did not respond to repeated doses of meters alone. So we needed to intubate her. We called anesthetist and intubated, paralyzed and ventilated. She was transferred to ICU for the management. The sodium valproate also started. So with its CT, non contact CT of brain, it showed mild edema and there was no ICH. Basic investigation showed normal electrolytes, Calcium was normal, magnesium was normal, creatine was normal, and uh, liver enzyme slightly elevated. After 48 hours, we extubated. There was no more fit. The DC is normal, 15 or 50. She was afebrile. The blood pressure was normal. White cell phone was normal. Later, it picked up to 120,000. So we did an EEG, EEG show generalized slow wave activity. On day 11, uh, we read uh, lumpa puncture to see whether he has uh, inflammatory evidence. So it was normal. Lymphocyte 2, neutrophil 0, protein normal, super normal. So uh, a patient with dengue recovered while uh, awaiting discharge developed a convulsion. And the EEG showed slow wave activity, generalized slow activity, but the CSF is normal. So we suspected whether the patient has got a dengue encephalopathy. On day 12, she was discharged with a sodium valproate, planning to give for three months and to tail off later. So these two cases uh, are examples of neurological complication of dengue. In addition to that, you can get convulsion before the development of febrile illness. The our first case presented with a convulsion. So on day second only, he developed fever. The second case, she, the patient 
recovered from the febrile illness. After recovery, she developed a conversion. So you can get conversion before the onset of febrile illness, even after also. Or third case, yes. These are the neurological manifestation of dengue. Neurological problem can occur due to, due to direct invasion of viral, like encephalitis, myelitis, or immunological uh, reaction that you rise to transverse myelitis, Guillain-Barre syndrome, autoimmune cerebral uh, myelitis, or due to vascular event like ICH or so. Encephalopathy is a, a condition due to uh, vascular, microvascular thrombosis or metabolic abnormality during the critical phase of dengue hemorrhagic fever. Our third case is somewhat different. Um, she's a 21-year-old female admitted with two days history of fever, vomiting, diarrhea. She was previously healthy, developed fever, throat pain, severe water diarrhea more than 30 times. With abdominal pain and vomiting, she vomited more than five times. There's no cough or shortness of breath. And there was no similar illness in the family such as food poisoning. On examination, she was looked she looked ill. She was not this snake. This is normal. She is conscious, rational, but febrile, severely dehydrated, obviously due to severe diarrhea, all peripheries. There were few blisters on the side of the neck. The BP was low, 80 or 54, heart rate fast, 116. Saturation is normal, 98% on air. The lungs were clear, abdomen soft. The basic ingestion shows the neutrophil ecocytosis, the full blood count 17,800 with neutrophil 93%. Plater count is low, 56,000. And this hematocrit also high, 48, showing hemoglobin concentration. CRP is high, 107. Urine, uh, UFR shows few pus cells. And the uh, NS antigen, dengue antigen is positive. Liver enzymes are so slightly elevated with INR also 1.2, renal function created 1.3, electrolytes sodium 130, potassium 3.6. Chest X is normal, ECG short, sinus tachycardia. So she was managed at the PC at the beginning. Obviously, there's severe dehydration and she's, she was in shock. Probably, uh, Hypovolemic shock due to severe diarrhea and vomiting. The cause for the diarrhea, dengue can present with uh, diarrhea and vomiting, but very severe diarrhea causing hypertension shock is very uncommon. So here, the neutrophil leukocytosis, high CRP, suggestive of an, another infection or bacterial infection in addition to dengue is suspected. So therefore, we took cultures from blood, urine, and uh, stool. And started on IV septriaxone. She needed uh, uh, the proper fluid therapy. So we started on normal saline, 20 ml per kg per hour. Diarrhea continued. So after four hours, we reassessed. That is day two of 2 a.m. Her BP was still low, 85 for 50. Heart rate is 122. So we thought uh, septic shock also due to bacterial infection. Uh, uh, the shock may be due to, in addition to dehydration, septic part also there, septic shock due to vasodilation was there. So we needed, she, uh, the patient needed a vas 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 support. So we started noradine, starting from 0.2 micrograms per minute. So BP picked up, so we reduced the fluid to 10 ml per kg. Urine output was uh, maintained uh, 40 ml per hour. Plate count dropped to 36,000. Hematoglobin was 36. Hemoglobin was 11.12. On day two, 8 a.m., the second day on day two, since the patient was unstable, so we decided to transfer the patient to ICU. That time her conscious level is normal. This is 15 or 50. She was not dyspneic, but febrile. Diarrhea continued, but the frequency reduced. 
there were blisters that spread all over the body. It was there in the neck at the beginning. Now it spread to arms and tongue. The blisters were serious filled, thin walled blisters measuring 0.5 to 1.5 centimeter. Urinary output maintained. That's a good uh, sign. BP was still low, 90 or 55. Always the diastolic pressure was low, probably due to vasodilatation, vasodilation due to set fish. Heart rate fast still. So we continued normal cell 150 ml per hour. An additional 150 ml per hour given, 150 ml per given for every school she passed. In addition to noradrenaline, the patient needed another vasopressor support. So we started on metraminerol 2 mg per hour. So since he had uh, uh, widespread blisters, high fever, severe diarrhea, so we got a uh, second opinion from microbiologist at General Hospital Baticolo. She suspected a toxic shock syndrome, probably due to group A streptococci or commonly occurred Steph aureus, whether MRSA positive or negative. She also suggested to add IV ticoplanin in addition to ceftriaxone. An initial ultrasound scan to see the leakage was done and it showed negative for leakage. So the, the hypotension, the shock, most likely due to dehydration and vasodilation. There was no evidence of leakage due to dengue hemorrhage fever at that time. The plate dropped to 12,000 and hematocrit maintained around 35. The second day evening, uh, in the afternoon around 3 p.m., we reassessed the patient. The patient became dysnic at that time, but afebrile, GCS was normal. Saturation dropped to 75% on air. There was uh, reduced air entry in the right lung base, and there were bilateral crepitation in the lungs, suggestive of pulmonary edema. BP also low, 85 or 50. Heart rate is 120. You are now reduced to 36 ml per hour. So we suspect that pulmonary edema and uh, the force may be due to uh, of, over, overloading of fluid or myocarditis. So we did ECG, ECG so sinus tachycardia only. Prop 5 was normal. Hemoglobin was normal. Plated further drop to 12,000. There was acidosis, pH of 7.2, and raised lactate, 4.6, and the calcium also low. Since the saturation dropped and lungs of evidence of edema, she needed uh, intubation. So we intubated her and ventilated. And we stopped IU fleet. She needed dextran to build up her pressure. So we gave the uh, external 500 ml bolus and she needed a second bolus of 250 ml to maintain her blood pressure. So we did the uh, repeat ultrasound to see whether the patient had confirmed the leakage and then uh, it showed a leakage in the abdomen as well as in the lungs. There was moderate amount of pleural leakage in the right lung base. So we stopped IU fleet but we gave only uh, 150 ml for each stool she passed. In addition to that, we also gave sodium backup to correct uh, acidosis and calcium glucan to correct hypocalcemia. The second day in the, in the night, around 8 p.m., we reassessed the patient. She was afebrile. Diarrhea was there, but the frequency reduced. Saturation maintained with mechanical ventilator. A BP still uh, 100 over 60, a little bit uh, stable, heart rate 110, and plate dropped to 10,000. Hematocrit 34, urine output still low, 35 ml per hour. We restarted IU fluid, low rate, 70 ml per hour. Third day of admission around 5 a.m., we noticed there were Bleeding from the vena puncture site. BP dropped to 79 or 52. And the HP also dropped to 9.2. Plato dropped to 8,000. 
PCB also dropped to 29 and the urine also dropped to 20 ml power. And the INR was high 3.2, liver enzymes elevated. So there was obviously there was bleeding that also contributed to the shock. So we had to give we had to give one pint of pack cell, three packs of uh, FFT, six packs of platelet. Plate. After transfusion, patient became stable, blood pressure 110 over 70, heart rate reduced to 108, pack cell uh, PCV became 32, plated slate to raised to 36,000. Hemoglobin was 9.8, INR dropped to 1.7. In the afternoon, third day of admission, in the afternoon 2 p.m., we reassessed the patient. The bleeding stopped. The area was stopped. Now she is she was afebrile. Blood pressure stable. Heart rate around 112. Hemoglobin maintained around 9.8. Plated picked up to 42,000. And urine output is still low. It's about 25 ml power. Full blood count white cells started rising and the blood picture we sent it became neutrophil leukocytosis with the toxic renal suggestive of bacterial infection. There was no evidence of DIC. So we continued normal cell in around 70 ml per hour. In addition to that, we gave vitamin K and FAP. Second, uh, two packs of uh, uh, FAP since the since uh, iron was a little bit high, 1.7. On day 3, uh, 9 p.m., we reassessed the patient. Now, patient a little bit stable. Diarrhea stopped, fever. There was no fever. And new blisters stopped appearing. Patient become improved. The urine also increased to 110 ml. It's almost a uh, polyuric phase, probably uh, recovering from the de uh, dengue hemorrhagic fever. And the platelet count also picked up to 46,000. So we reduced uh, uh, normal cell into 50 ml per hour. And now the metronomy also we stopped. So we by vasopressor support, we gradually tail off. On day four, the area, the area completely stopped. You no, know, there was no fever, blood, uh, blood pressure picked up and stable, heart rate reduced to 88, blood picked up to 62,000. And PEX cell uh, PCV uh, 35, urine output improved, is still uh, urine output show polyuric, probably recovering. So we stop IV fluid and we started on NG feeding 50 ml per hour. By the time the cultures all came as negative. On day five, patient stable, the clinical parameters were stable, blood pressure is maintained normal. Later, it picked up to 55,000. Urine output still polyuric, SPO to 98. So we changed to CPF mode from CMD mode since uh, saturation, everything maintained. So we slowly, gradually uh, reduced uh, normally to 0.5 mic, mic. On day six, she was stable, so we planned to extubate. She was conscious, rational. All the other parameters were stable. So we continued antibiotic for 10 days and she was discharged on day 11. So this uh, case, uh, an example where multiple mechanism forcing shock. So dengue or hemorrhage fever, dengue infection also com uh, contributing and complicating the management of especially fluid therapy. This is an example how the dengue infection complicating with other infection causing several management difficulties. So in our case, the possibility of shock due to dehydration, septic shock or toxic shock syndrome, and leakage of plasma due to dengue, bleeding, and myocardial depression due to acidosis, hypoxia. All this contributed to produce shock. So this is one of the difficult cases. Uh, fortunately, the patient recovered from this critical illness. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Hafil, for sharing your experience. Uh, 
of uh, very rare presentations and complicated cases of dengue patients presented in uh, the managing local hospital at the Ashrop Hospital, Kalmuni. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hafil, for very interesting and very informative presentation. And now we are coming to the Q&A session. Uh, there is a question in the Q&A box. Uh, the questions go to Dr. Atukorala. Uh, the question is, is, are there any serum markers to, di uh, markers to diagnose mucomycosis? Dr. Atukor. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, I have already answered that uh, question, answered. sir. Yes. Nothing is so far, no serum markers, actually. But in aspergillosis, we can do the serum galactomelin. Uh, that is sort of the antigen detection test. But uh, in mucomycosis, we don't have any serum markers. Uh, but gold standard is uh, histology, biopsy and histology. Even cultures, as I have, I have already discussed, that uh, as a normal commensal, they can get contaminated. Even cultures become positive. Therefore, uh, gold standard will be histology. Uh, so far, no antigen markers. Okay, thank you, Dr. Atukor. And also, I would like to ask a question from Dr. Atukor. Uh, regarding your second patient, that patient has uh, T had TB and mucomycosis. So, yes. uh, when you follow up this patient, as you mentioned also, did she develop uh, any features of uh, liver toxicity with uh, treatment? Uh, no, luckily. This patient didn't develop any liver toxicity uh, because uh, at the time uh, uh, when we are starting this amphotericin, because uh, at that time we got uh, liposomal amphotericin B and uh, we have continued about, uh, we have uh, more than one month we have completed this uh, intensive phase of anti-TB treatment. Uh, patient didn't develop any liver toxicity oh. because the patient was on uh, uh, statin treatment as well, but uh, we closely monitored. Uh, actually, once in three four days, uh, we did uh, uh, liver functions and renal functions, and uh, uh, about uh, one week we have to give the supplementary oxygen as well. In mycosis actually, the uh, high flow of oxygen uh, that is one treatment modality. Uh, but uh, this patient actually we give the uh, uh, oxygen because she has developed uh, uh, low saturation. Uh, but the patient didn't develop any renal or uh, liver involvement. But first patient, uh, because uh, she had a lot of vomiting after giving this amphotericin. I think that that's the reason why this patient has got renal uh, derangement. But uh, after rehydration, actually the renal functions back to normal. But two days we have to treat with half the dose of uh, this uh, uh, recommended dose uh, from half the dose of this uh, recommended uh, uh, amphotericin uh, dose. After two days, once the, the patient recovered, we gradually increased to and back to the normal regime uh, uh, dose of this amphotericin. Okay, thank you very Actually, much. Actually, this Dr. patient was uh, weight about uh, 50 kilos. We have to give three vials. Okay. Per day. Thank you very much, Dr. Atukolan. Also, uh, this is another question I'd like to ask from you. Uh, we have yes. seen most of the cases of mucomycosis patients, uh, all of, almost all patients we have seen who are having diabetes. So what yes. is your experience and how common uh, the mucomycosis without diabetes mellitus? Yes, sir, I have not seen even a single patient uh, mucomycosis without diabetes. Yeah, that's what we also because, have. Uh, yeah, yeah, because uh, we are uh, sharing together that ENT board and the respiratory board. And I have seen two or three patients mucomycosis involving the sinusitis. But uh, these patients also having... Uh, uh, diabetes. diabetes actually my another patient that third patient actually he presented with diabetic ketoacidosis and uh, incidentally we found that patient is having a uh, lung involvement when we are screening for the infections because of this fever spike then only we came to the diagnosis of mucomycosis okay but other two patients didn't have any ketoacidosis yes okay Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Atukola, for your, again, your very interesting and informative presentation. And also, may I ask one question from Dr. Hafil? 
uh, as uh, your third patient uh, developed blisters and yes. uh, all cultures uh, negative. Yes. Uh, did you do any culture from the, uh, the, the blister fluids? Uh, we were unable to do cultures from the ah. blisters. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Hafil, for again your interesting presentation. And uh, now, uh, in the absence of any more questions, let me to wind up the sessions today. First, I would like to thank two speakers, Dr. Gayanath Atukorala and Dr. Aim Hafil, for accepting our invitation to share their experience with us also. Uh, for their excellent presentations. Also, I would like to thank CCP staff, audiovisual team, Mr. Nalina and sponsors. Sponsor, uh, Merck Pharmaceuticals, they always sponsor for uh, peer learning periphery to four sessions. Uh, also for their continuous support and all virtual participants who are joining with us today. Thank you very much. <laughs>